Hello lovely people. Today I am combining two of my favourite things, books and Derry Girls. Sophie Vlogs! I saw this book tag on uh, Read to Me at Midnight's channel. It's originally created by Pretty Purple Polka Dots. Um, I really like Derry Girls. I managed to watch all of Derry Girls um, when I was horrendously ill with one of those colds that makes you feel like you can barely function and my partner had to be away for the weekend so I literally just like rolled out the sofa bed wrapped myself in a blanket ate really really spicy food because it was the only thing I could taste and then I just watched all of Dairy Girls in one go in a kind of haze <laughs> Um, which personally felt like, for me, a really great way to consume it for the first time. So when I saw this tag, it seemed like the perfect little piece of fun frippery to do. So the first question is Erin, a book it took time to warm to. The book I'm choosing for this is Rebecca's Tale by Sally Bowman, because I actually started this, DNF'd it, and then returned to it at a later date. And I did actually end up really enjoying this. It was one of those things where I reread Rebecca and then I picked this up because I thought that that would work as a nice reading moment, but actually I think consuming this worked better with some space from the original text. This is set af 20 years after the events of Rebecca the book. The narrator marries this hugely rich guy called Maxim de Winter, she goes to stay with him on his estate in uh, Mandalay, and she finds herself sort of like haunted by the ghost of his first wife. This book has a bunch of different narrative perspectives and we're kind of just delving into into um, the question of like who was Rebecca and I think one thing that meant that I didn't get on with this initially is that the first perspective you have I found to be the the hardest one to engage to because it's this guy and he's a bit like pompous and he has this idea of who Rebecca is that I felt like was like a profound misreading of the original text but that is kind of the point. One thing that this book is exploring is the ways in which all of these different characters have their idea of who Rebecca is, and it's like the person who is doing the investigating is trying to sift all of these different versions apart and find the truth, and it is kind of looking at those ideas of like, can you ever really know someone, um, and all that sort of thing. So it is a, a book that I definitely settled into and I actually did end up having a good time. I liked this a lot more than I liked Mrs. De Winter, which is another book that is sort of like writing back against Rebecca and imagining who Rebecca could be. I felt like this one was more effective partly because um, more more happened <laughs> in some ways. My issues with Mrs. De Winter was it was it was just quite like a slow tale and not a lot happened, whereas this at least I felt like we were really playing around with these like ideas to do with Rebecca and her voice and that sort of thing. Question two is Michelle, your favourite strong female character. Um, I've gone for a book that I have banged on about quite a bit, I know, but um, it's Legibon by Tracy Dion, because what I love about this is, is Brie is a really strong female character. This follows 16 year old Brie. Her mother has recently died in a car accident. She's very much de dealing with this grief and trauma associated with that. She's gone to this university as part of this residential program and then while she's there she witnesses essentially like some students be attacked by this demon and then a bunch of like other students like sweep in and sort it all out and she's like what is happening? And so she essentially um, gets swept up in this like order of the round table and it's very much like she's infiltrating this organisation because she thinks there might be more to her mother's death, but also while infiltrating the organisation and understanding like the scale of like the conflict that appears to be on the horizon, she has to make some like difficult decisions about how far she's prepared to go and what she's prepared to do to like save the people she loves. Um, I think this is just like a masterful book, I think it's brilliant, I have banged on about it at some length so I will keep this brief, but the reason why I love Brie is number one, she is the heart of this book, you know, I just think that Brie is allowed to have such depth, she's allowed to be really strong, she has these amazing powers, she is capable of a lot of very good stuff, but also she is allowed to be vulnerable, she's allowed to be experiencing messy emotions in the wake of her mother's passing, she's allowed to have such a full range of emotions and experiences and that sort of thing and I just feel like she is just such a well-rounded character that felt so real and so I love her like I loved her she was just the heart of this book really um and so I just I wanted to pick her not just because she is strong but also because she is 
allowed to be vulnerable, and I appreciate that in a in a main character. Question three is Claire, an LGBT romance, bonus points if it's an FF romance. I've gone for, I know that this is sort of suggesting like a fictional romance book, I've gone for a real non-fiction book. This is Violet to Vita, The Letters of Violet Refuses to Vita Sackville West. I thought I'd talk about this because there's a book that has been very recently published, which is The Love Letters Between um, Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf. And I've seen that during the rounds, and I really want to get my hands on it because I do really want to read it. But I just thought I would mention this in case you are a fan of that but unaware of this. This is a different woman that Vita Sackville West was in love with. This is Violet Refuses. Um, the two of them had this wildly passionate affair. We only have one half of the letters because uh, the husband burned the other half of the letters. So we only have the letters of Violet to Vita. We don't have Vita's responses to Violet. But um, this is one of those where, like... It is just wildly passionate. These letters have these moments that are so beautiful and absolutely gorgeous expressions of love. At times it is also like it can be passionate to the extreme. There are, there are some, it's not always like necessarily the healthiest of relationships at times, um, but it is a, a beautiful look at a real relationship that two women had with each other with all of the um, highs and lows that accompany such things. Next up is Orla, a character with a head in the clouds. I've gone for two because I couldn't decide, so I thought I would just choose both. So first of all I've gone for Marianne from Sense and Sensibility. This follows these two sisters. They are very different in temperament. Marianne is very like emotion based. She she doesn't really stop to think things through. She just sort of like follows where her emotions take her. She can be a bit melodramatic. She has like a very romanticized idea of what her life will be like. But as this book goes on, both sisters sort of take on aspects of the other. So she definitely like grows as a character throughout this. So that's why I picked two books for this because I wasn't sure if she really counts as like head in the clouds so much as like a person who bases her life off of like strong emotions and that sort of thing who sort of like learns to take a bit more of a slower approach to things and and that kind of thing. My other one that I went for was As I Crossed a Bridge of Dreams by Lady Sarashina. The subtitle is like Recollections of a Woman in 11th Century Japan. We don't know who this woman actually was. Lady Sarashina is the name that is given to the author, but it is uh, recollections of her life during the Heian period in Japan. And the reason I chose this for this one is because she like is just giving you sort of like snippets into her life. But um, she really loves tales, so like the tale of Genji and stuff like this, like these um, real foundational um, pieces of Japanese literature she loves. And so sometimes it's almost like the reality of the world is, is a bit much for her, like when people, um, when she suffers loss, even just like um, moving away from people, that sort of thing, it affects her so deeply that often she, she retreats into these stories. And so there is like an element of this that is her she sort of exists in this slightly separate world where like she tells you a lot about dreams that she has she tells you a lot about tales that she reads and stuff like this and so she kind of is she kind of does have her head in the clouds in many ways but also I sometimes wondered while reading this whether it was a little bit of a front like I just feel like at the edges I think she's slightly more with it than maybe she is initially presenting to you. I don't know, it's one that I want to reread and I would love to read like literature about so that I can get a better understanding of it. I did find the introduction very interesting but I would like to read like more stuff on it. Next up is James, a translated book. I'm gonna go for one that I have sung the praises of very recently. This is The Root of Ice and Salt by Jose Luis Zarat, translated by uh, David Bowles. This is like an iconic piece of Mexican like gothic horror. This is the first time it's been translated into English. Um, it's a queer reimagining of Dracula and it is um, essentially like following the journey that Dracula's coffin took um, from Transylvania to Whitby. And obviously if you've read Dracula, you know that this ship arrives in Whitby um, and there is uh, no one aboard apart from the captain who is tied to the wheel, who is dead. So you, n so I had a wonderful experience reading this. I will link below the full review that I posted of this where it is like deliciously suspenseful. It's really playing around with the knowledge that you potentially have about Dracula. Um, it's very much suffused with like the physicality of this man's desire that he's trying to tamp down. 
um, I don't know, it was just one that I, I found for a very small book. I felt like it really packed a punch, and I just really enjoyed the reading of it. After that is Sister Michael, who is one of my favourite characters from the show. I love Siobhan so much, I think she's really great. Um, a book you studied at school, I've gone for um, A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. I loved Tennessee Williams when I was a teenager. Um, I studied A Streetcar Named Desire um, when I was doing my A-levels. We did like a whole, like my entire like final year of A-levels was like about love in literature, um, which is an interesting lens to view this play through. Fading Southern Belle, Blanche Dubois goes to stay with her sister Stella and Stella's husband. Essentially like it's this woman who sort of like bases her life on these like romantic illusions, really having it all shattered and really like breaking as a person. I haven't reread it in a long time. This is one of those plays that I would love to see performed. There is a film of it, um, which I have watched but not in a very long time. I just, one of my favourite things about Tennessee Williams is I feel like he does plays really well that are sort of like um, all about atmosphere, all about feelings, like maybe not the hugest amount plot-wise happens, but we're all about like the emotions of these people and like, I don't know, I just think he's like a master. This got me really interested in his work, um, so I did go and in my own time read a lot more of his plays and I wrote about them in my... Um, letter that you send to universities when you're like, oh, I'm a human, I have interests, I'm really into Tennessee Williams, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, so this one is always is one that I have like a real special place for because I think it really got me into um, plays in some ways. I've not been the hugest reader of plays, but this was one of those like early moments I remember of like realising that I could read a play and it could be interesting and have all these things to it, you know? After that is Grandad Joe, a grumpy character you can't help but love. I've gone for Granny Weatherwax, and I don't know if grumpy is necessarily the correct word for this, because um, she's one of the main characters in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. Um, the thing about Granny Weatherwax is not necessarily that she's grumpy grumpy, it's that she suffers no fools. She's prepared to, to do the things that need to be done. Like, for example, in, like, Weird Sisters, and you have the trio, and, you know, it's based on, like, Mother Maiden Crone concept. Um, but um, I just think that she often serves as a very good foil to other characters in sort of like these group dynamics and she is immensely powerful but also like is very concerned with not letting that go too far. I don't know, I just think she's a really great character. I think she grows in interesting ways throughout the series. She might not be the character with the most obvious character growth um, but through my rereads like I've definitely had novels where it's like okay she needs to re-establish like boundaries for herself and stuff like that. I don't know. I just think she's fab and I love her very much. <laughs> Ma Mary and Da Jerry, your favourite bookish parents. I've gone for um, Matthew and Marilla from Anne of Green Gables. It does look a bit better without the dust jacket on because the dust jacket is really beaten up by now. This is my mum's copy, so I have had this since I was a child. Um, but I didn't read it properly until a few years ago. And I just, I was so touched by the relationship that Matthew and Marilla have with Anne. They both express their love for her in very different ways. They're expecting like a boy and then it's Anne that turns up and she like talks 19 to the dozen and all of these things and they just like really take her into their hearts and I don't know, I just thought it was so sweet. Um, there was a moment in this involving them which if you've read the book you'll know happens really near the end and it just oh god it really broke me um so yeah i just think that they are such a wonderful example of like people who are adopting a child into their lives that just sort of like allow that child to be who they are while nurturing them i don't know i just think they're really really sweet then it's jenny joyce your favorite bookish clever clock i went for six who is in um the lost future of pepper harrow by Natasha Pulley. This is kind of a sequel to, well it is a sequel, no kind of about it, this is a sequel to The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. Six is a small child who Kato Mori, one of the main characters, uh, found working in a um, workhouse and he has essentially like taken her out of it and adopted her and him and Nathaniel, who are the two main characters of this book, are her dads and it's really sweet. Six is very much, I think, intended to be read as being autistic and again, I could have chosen Nathaniel and Cato for the parents because one thing I really loved about this book is 
um, they never try to alter her behaviour or her way of viewing the world. It's very much a case of like they're trying to give her all the tools she needs to survive if if she ever has to survive without them. But like they very much um, respect her boundaries, respect how she um, wishes to experience affection and give affection. Um, I just felt like they, as parental figures for this small child that they have adopted, is there a theme here? Um, really like respect her as a person, an individual. The reason I chose Six is because she is absolutely like a genius when it comes to um, sort of like, I don't know the correct term for it, like electrician? <laughs> The book is set in the late 1800s, so um, that sort of era of like um, electricity being a thing, but also having all of these unexplored avenues, and she's very instinctive with her knowledge, but also like wants to, every time they meet someone who who can do things that she doesn't know how to do, she wants to ask them loads of questions and find out so she can do it. Like she is, uh, has one of those minds that just wants to like discover things. Aunt Sarah, a book with a pretty cover. I have also gone for two. <laughs> First of these is uh, The Deathless Girls by Kieran Millward Hargreaves. This is another queer Dracula retelling, and I actually did a review where I talked about both this and The Root of Ice and Salt, so I will leave those down below. I didn't like this one as much because I felt like it was very, very slow, and I had some niggles about it, but I do think that the cover is stunning. I love this colour palette. All of these things obviously have meaning when you read the book, but I just, I love this colour palette. I love like the highlight of copper. I think it's really beautiful. It also has these really gorgeous end papers in as well. And I just, I think that this is a beautiful physical book, even though I had some niggles with it as a readable book. <laughs> um, the other one is a gorgeous hardcover. This is The Mystery of the Blue Train by Agatha Christie. I just think that this edition is absolutely stunning. This one also has these absolutely gorgeous end papers too. Um, I haven't read this one yet. I don't actually really know a lot about this, but I love Agatha Christie's murder mysteries anyway, so I thought treat yourself, go for it. And sometimes it's nice to go into a mystery not knowing anything because then you get the surprise and the exploration, you know? Finally is Uncle Colm, a book you can't shut up about. I'm going for Midnight Check-In and Other Recipes Worth Living For by Ella Risbridger. I very recently published the book chat where I talk about this. I have since reread it since doing that book chat. My sweet friend who gifted this book to me, every single time she or I cook recipes from this book, we send each other pictures and we give each other like a mini review of how the recipe went. Um, and now I've been starting to do this with other people. I had like a picnic with my friend and I gave her some of the cookies that I made and she loved them and then my partner asked me to make the cookies again so like I've become one of those people that just this is like a reference point in my life now that I talk about I talk about what I'm going to cook from it I talk about the essays inside of it and which ones touched me and that sort of thing so um it's just I've become one of those people I'm just obsessed with this book it falls open on all the pages of the things that I've made I've been writing like when I made them it's a whole thing we're having a time the next part of this is about like tagging your bookish dairy girl friends I don't know who of my bookish friends like Dairy Girls, so I'm not actually going to tag anyone, but please do, if you like Dairy Girls and you want to do this tag, please do consider yourself tagged, because I would have tagged you if I had known that you would be interested. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would love to know if you've read any of these, if you have feelings on them, or what you would have chosen for these answers. Um, do leave a comment down below, always brightens my little day. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I hope you're having a lovely day, I will see you next time for something different.